All right, well, welcome back again. Doug Guzet here, and today uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about sinkholes, but mostly about dye tracing and other types of tracing. Uh, sinkholes, as we'll discuss at a different time, are mostly uh, ways of connecting surface water and surface drainage to the subsurface. And we've talked here and there about aquifers and groundwater and really what's unique about karst and, and speleology and, and Missouri caves is that the passages, our aquifers are largely big enough that you could crawl through them or, or walk through them. Uh, that's what's unique about karst places. You can get inside the aquifer, as one of my former uh, co-workers likes to say, uh, used to like to say, you can be the aquifer. You can be a water drop moving through the earth. And uh, so we know that that's what's going on, and we know that sinkholes are often the entrance to that. Sometimes the cave passages along uh, where a stream or a spring comes out on a stream valley, but sometimes it's the sinkhole. And if you think about those two and, and think going back into the part of the earth that we don't see or may not be able to walk through, uh, where I like to call micro caves, things that uh, little bugs and critters can get through and water can get through, but you and I cannot, then we realize that sinkholes are connected to our springs and our groundwater and even people that have wells that uh, intersect the water table through a cave. So that leads us to a lot of questions. I get often uh, called as a university expert and asked, could I tell somebody where the pollution is coming from that is coming out of a spring or where the water is coming from that's coming out of a cave? And the short answer is, not unless I can trace it, I would only be able to make an educated or semi-educated guess at best. So that's why we do tracing. And the most common type of tracing I think nowadays is a thing called dye tracing. We use fluorescing dyes or, or the same dyes that make your clothes different colors. Uh, or as people, you know, dye eggs for holiday times in, in America or something. So what we do is we use these dyes, but I'm going to talk about other reasons to trace also. So the first reason to trace is just to investigate a flow path. It's just to move from point A to point B. How did the water get from where it was to where I found it? Or, in fact, what is where it was if I've found it somewhere? The other thing is, once we know that connection, we often want to trace the water to determine how fast it's moving. Water that seeps through the ground in, in a big sandstone aquifer often moves in what we call geologic time. It might move a few inches or a few feet per day or feet per year. And in a cave, where it's usually like an open passage or an open pipe, it might move a few feet per second or a few feet per hour or per minute. So that's a much faster velocity. Uh, one area of the country I was familiar with earlier in my career, uh, I got asked because we knew there were sinkholes uh, very close by to a major interstate highway and a major uh, rail line transport. And so any automobile wreck, uh, tractor trailer wreck, or uh, train wreck that might have spilled chemicals or even gasoline on the ground might have in fact washed right into that sinkhole and we knew from our dye tracing that it was less than 24 hours from that sinkhole to where that emerged as a spring that a town of about 25,000 people had grown up around and in fact they still use that spring for their water supply. So that leads us to the other piece. We may investigate flow paths, we may try to understand how fast the water is moving and we also use that for what we call wellhead protection in the environmental industry. It's a way of protecting our water supply uh, by understanding where our watershed is. On the surface, you and I can look at one hilltop and another and the stream in the middle and understand that that is the watershed that drains into our river. But in the subsurface, it's not quite as obvious. We know that the water table is subdued uh, reproduction or mimics the topography and oftentimes caves or sinkholes might even cross what are surface watershed boundaries. And then last but certainly not least we actually sometimes do tracing just to support other research. Maybe there's geologic reasons to understand how different rocks have uh, 
been altered through time. Uh, there is hydrologic research that goes on with all of the movement of water. And sometimes it's just biologic research. Sometimes we're uh, studying the ecosystem and how plants or animals can actually move uh, with the water or where their water supply is coming from. Well, let me tell you about some of the tracers that have been used. In the early days, uh, some of the earliest tracers actually were just grains of corn. You know, old seed corn that would be in a field, somebody might have noticed it coming out of a spring and might have realized if there's a crack or a cave passage or a sinkhole somewhere, then if that corn, old corn is big enough to come out of the spring, it's big enough to go through that system. So maybe I would go put a bag of seed corn into a sinkhole and watch it flow in with the water that was draining in there and then run and see or have my son or daughter or my family or my friends out looking at the various springs to see where that corn came out. Uh, as we matured a little bit, sometimes people used uh, a type of moss, like a club moss or little spores that are uh, certain uh, biological features that are distinctive DNA that we could trace or distinctive just the moss, the look of little club moss is pretty common. I think most of us know moss growing on stones or trees. And so if you could sprinkle bits of that in the water and watch it flow somewhere, that was another way to trace the water. And in fact, an early easy way to trace water was salt. You could pour a lot of salt in and it would dissolve in the water very easily. And that's what you want, a tracer that's going to go with the water. And so if salt would dissolve in the water and move along, then if you could detect the salt at the other end, well, you could either take a cup of the water and see if it got saltier, or uh, in modern electrical instrumentation, it's actually pretty easy to determine that salt water conducts electricity, even with just a little nine volt battery, easier and better than fresh water does. And so there's lots of little ways that we could detect those things. And those were all fairly cheap and easy, inexpensive tracers uh, used in the early days. Well, what are we using in modern days? Uh, we use things that have been in the atmosphere, uh, radionuclides, uh, above ground radiation uh, explosions, nuclear bomb testing, uh, left us a peak from the 1940s and 50s and 60s of radioactive elements. And so we could use, we could assume roughly a midpoint of that testing uh, around 1962 or 63 usually. And we could say that water that had a certain amount of that radioactive nuclei, uh, nuclide in there might have in fact entered the ground in about 1963. Or we can actually add radionuclides that aren't naturally occurring in the water and uh, just trace those elements. We could add um, noble gases, inert things, things that don't react with other chemicals in the water. Helium is a noble gas. It's an inert gas. It reacts with my vocal cords. I could talk funny with it. But it's otherwise pretty easy if it stays dissolved in the water. It's easy for it to bubble out, though, as you might guess. Um, fluorocarbons. Some people remember CFCs or chlorofluorocarbons that were used in aerosol cans for many years and thankfully are reducing their use. Um, through the years of refrigeration and air conditioning units, we had different versions of Freon. And again, many of those versions kind of were developed as a new and improved Freon that would be used for 8 or 10 or 12 years before the next iteration or the next revised new and improved Freon. So if you've worked in uh, some of these industries, you may know that there's Freon 12, Freon 13, Freon 112, and Freon 113. There's different Freons that actually came from different decades in the atmosphere. And we could estimate how far those have moved through the environment. Uh, but what I really use and what most uh, karst experts and sinkhole experts use often is fluorescent dyes. We use dyes that are designed to absorb light at a certain wavelength and then that gets the atoms, the molecules in the dye excited and as they bounce around and jiggle around they actually emit what's called a photon. They emit a little light beam. And you probably know this very well. If you've ever been under black light and noticed your clothes glowing that's because many of the dyes that I use are similar to dyes that are in laundry detergents, many laundry, most laundry detergents, and they make your whites whiter and your brights brighter, and they actually absorb the wavelengths of black light, the ultraviolet light wavelength, 
and that's what makes your clothes glow a, a little special bright in black light. So I use those same kind of dyes. I buy them in much smaller batches, and we use those because, just like in the laundry detergent, they dissolve well in water, they move through nature. Uh, the laundry industry uses ones that actually like to absorb to the fabric of materials. Uh, some of our dyes do the same thing, so I can put cotton in the water and use that and see if the cotton starts to glow uh, in the dark. I have to take it into a dark lab. But I also have a machine that is designed to put light into a little sample chamber. I take a little sample of the water, shoot that light in at the right wavelength to make the dye fluoresce, and then it has an electric eye that I can read a digital readout of how bright the electric eye is sensing that light beam from the fluorescing from those photons. So those are kind of what we do. Uh, we're using molecules that are designed to work at certain wavelengths, and in fact there's different colored dyes that work at different wavelengths. It's uh, sometimes surprising to people if you've ever taken a prism and put white light through it and split it into all the colors of the rainbow, what many people don't realize is what you and I see as color in clothes is usually things that are detecting other colors or absorbing other wavelengths of light. And so we can buy dyes that are designed to do different wavelengths. Uh, a very common one is a dye that's sort of bright green when I pour it into the ground. And another one is bright red or blood red almost. Uh, and there's a whole variety in between, yellow, blue, whatever. And each of those works at a different wavelength, and I have a machine that is good enough to let them be detected at different wavelengths. And I'll put a little thing of the wavelengths and the spectrum and, and uh, the nanometers of visible light and infrared light and ultraviolet light up on our Blackboard site. But really what I want you to understand is when I do dye tracing, there's a couple of features I have to look for. The first thing is I have to be careful of the visibility in water. In other words, for example, that blood red dye, nobody wants their water to turn blood red. It might be a nice special effect in the movies, but it's not very popular with people. And so I have to keep that dye below a certain concentration. Usually it's right around 100 parts per billion, 100 micrograms per liter of water. And that is enough that if I poured that dye in a, that water with that dye in it at that concentration in a beaker and put it on a white table or a white tablecloth, you might look and say it's just a little pinkish. But that's about it. I try to stay usually a factor of 10 below that when I'm doing my projects because my instrument will actually pick it up in the parts per trillion range. 1,000 parts per trillion is one part per billion. So I have a little bit of ability to do that, but it's still a fairly narrow range if you think about how big a watershed might be and how much it might dilute the amount of dye I pour in the ground. The other thing with these dyes is they are regulated. Uh, most of them are either regulated by the federal US EPA or the Food and Drug Administration if it's a dye that might be used anywhere where foods could come into contact with them, uh, such as uh, plastic tables or even paper plates or plastic plates. Those dyes then are subject to environmental laws that require us to test the toxicity. Most of the dyes I use are what's called low toxicity. They do have some numbers that if they were in several hundred if not several thousand parts per billion and I try to stay below a hundred parts per billion they might stress some fish or some salamanders some of the aquatic uh, animals that live in the waters they might stress those in 96 hours of exposure so I try to keep the exposure short and I have to use dyes that have known toxicity and, and low toxicity. <clears throat> there are two other things that we look for in dyes the first thing is we want it to be what we call conservative. We want it to move along with the water. So if I wanted to use ping pong balls to go from a sinkhole through a cave system, I could do that in some places, but in other places the cave or the water might slide down to a little crack in the rock that's too small for the ping pong balls and they'd all just stack up. That's not a conservative tracer. That tracer would be what we call absorbing into uh, where the water passage narrows down. There's another thing I have to pay attention to because many times I'm putting dye in one place and testing or monitoring a large number of other places. 
it's possible the dye could come out and be exposed to, on the surface in a stream or a spring to sunlight before I would get to test it. And so I have to make sure that that dye doesn't break down in sunlight. Sunlight has all these ultraviolet lights, black light, all the wavelengths. And so these dyes that are designed to you know, vibrate their molecules and break apart eventually in that do in fact degrade in sunlight. Some of the dyes I've used degrade 10% of their brightness value per day, per 24 hour day in the sunlight, in full sunlight. And then we also have to think about interferences. There's lots of interferences out there, things you may not realize. Uh, the runoff from parking lots. If you've ever put antifreeze in your car or windshield fluid that was blue or green or yellow green, many of those colors are the same dyes that we use. And so if there's very much running off into the streams or the sinkholes, that might interfere with my dye trace. Uh, there are inks, what makes a blue ink pen or a red ink pen. Uh, and so again, if somebody has thrown a bunch of ink out or printing ink out uh, in the wrong place, it could uh, interfere with the trace that we're trying to do. And actually, it turns out some sewage, you know, household sewage has those same laundry detergents in it. Uh, septic tanks often have those. So those are the things we consider. We use that dye tracing to help us understand how the water got from point A to point B, how fast it moves, and it's because sinkholes and all the rest of these features that we're talking about are really parts of the natural drainage system of Earth in a place that's full of limestone or other carbonate rocks like dolostone. So that's where I'm going to stop for today, and we'll uh, come back later and look at other pieces of that.